Hello friends, welcome back to my channel Mukesh English. This is Mukesh Soni. Friends, in this video, we are going to have a discussion of the KSET examination question paper that is English subject. We are going to have the question paper discussion of English paper 2, 2014, uh, the year 2014 question paper discussion. And uh, this question paper will help those aspirants, those who are uh, really working hard to qualify the KSET or the other state eligibility test for the lectureship or for the assistant professor, the SLAT or the UGC net examination aspirants. Now the answers for this question paper is based on the answer key given by the exam coordinating university, that is the University of Mysore. So let's begin the discussion of 2014 question paper of KSET, English paper two. So let's begin the question paper discussion. And in this question paper, along with the questions answers, we shall have a discussion of some extra information with uh, with respect to the particular uh, question. So let's begin it. So this is a question paper of 2014, KSET examination, Kanatka state eligibility test, English paper two. So let's begin it. So here, the question number one. Question number one, Pierce Plowman written by William Langland. And the answer is here, it's an allegorical poem. It's an allegorical poem. And the extra information is here, the Piers Plowman or the Visio Velmley de Petro Plowman is a Middle English allegorical, allegorical narrative poem by William Langland. It's written in unrhymed alliterative verse divided into sections that's called passes, P-A-S-S-U-S. So the option answer is here, option number C. The C, the Pierce Plowman by William Langlet, Langland is an allegorical, allegorical poem. Question number two, which of the following uh, characters in Chaucer's Canterbury Tales is not an example of the corrupt elegy? So the answer is here, the parson. The parson is not the example of the corrupt, in the corrupt clergy. That means to say the monk, the friar, the partner, they are the examples of the corrupt clergy. So Chaucer's friar, friar is portrayed as a greedy hypocrite. He tells a tale about a summoner who bribes an old innocent widow. The summoner in retaliation uh, skewers friars in his tale. Uh, he's satirizing their long whiteness and the high and the hypocrisy and uh, the partner, the partner openly, openly admits in telling the false relics, the false relics to parishioners. Then the partner is the biggest example of the corruption and hypocrisy of these religious characters of the church. His tale shows how he preached against what he was doing and stole from people for his own greediness. And the last one is here, the parson, the parson who is not the corrupt clergy because he is a religious man and especially one who works for the church, but he is not a, he is not a corrupt clergy. So the monk, friar and the partner, they are the corrupt clergy in the Canterbury Tales of Chaucer. Now the question number three, the highlighted one are the answers. In his apology for poetry, Sidney defends poetry against the charge of, answer is here, falsehood. So Sidney who wrote, who wrote an apology for poetry in the year 1580, 1580, but it was published in 1595. And Sidney's reason for writing an apology for poetry was that he wished to defend poetry from the from the allegations imposed by England or the English satirist Stephen Gosson and the other critics of that time. So due to those allegations, he wrote an apology for poetry in the year 1580, but it was published in 1595. So like this, I'll be giving you some extra inform information. Answers are already highlighted on your screen. Question number four. Which of the following is not a sonnet sequence in English? So epithelium, epithelium is not a sonnet sequence in English. So now the question is here. That means to say uh, Amoretti, uh, Astrophel, and Stella, and Delia. Delia, these are three are the sonnet sequence in English, but epithel uh, epithelium 
is not the sonnet sequence in english so let's have some basic some more information what is sonnet sequence a sonnet sequence is a group of sonnets thematically unified to create a long work although generally uh, just like the stanza each sonnet are very much connected they can also be read as a meaningful separate unit and the sonnet sequence was very popular genre during the renaissance following the pattern of petrarch petrarch and uh, sir philip sydney a uh, very lauded co courtier in elizabeth one's court wrote the first known petrarchan sonnet sequence in english in the in 1580s and and so many great poets they also opted to use the form from the from that point until the end of renaissance so who is the first person who is uh, who is the first person who brought the sonnet sequence is here in the form of petrarchan sonnet that is sir philip sydney so this is one extra information now the another extra information we have here the epithelamine so what is epithelamine epithelamine is an ode red od is an ode written by edmund spencer to his bride elizabeth boyle on their wedding day in 1594 it was first published in 1595 in london by william ponsby by william ponsonby by william ponsonby so it so epithelamine is not a sonnet sequence it's an ode written by edmund spencer for his bride elizabeth boyle so these are the four questions now we are moving to the question number 5 uh who introduced blank verse to english poetry the earl of surrey henry howard henry howard the earl of surrey introduced blank verse to england in the 16th century with his translation of virgil's aeneid and christopher marlowe and william shakespeare they transformed this blank verse into the characteristic medium of elizabethan and jacobean drama question number 6 which poem by milton contains an attack which poem by milton contains an attack against corrupt clergyman so that the answer is here uh, lycidas lycidas is is a poem by john milton which was written in 1637 it's a pastoral elegy elegy it first appeared in 1638 collection of elegies and uh, question number 7 the famous bargain scene in the way of the world in the way of the world is about what it's about assertion of women's rights so what is the way of the world the way of the world is written by william congreve the proviso and here in this one the proviso scene is very famous because in this scene we see mirabel and milament they meet to make a marriage agreement so the way of the world is written by william congreen and here the bargain scene is about assertion of women's rights and here the proviso scene is very famous because in that particular scene we find mirabel and milament they meet to make some sort of marriage agreement now the question number 8 in which book of in which book of paradise lost does saturn succeeded succeed in tempting eve and the answer is here book number 9 of paradise lost the saturn succeed in tempting eve so uh, what happens in this in this book here Eve is taken in. Eve is taken in by the word by the words of the serpent, and after some rationalizing, she convinces herself that she should eat the fruit, and she does. She eats the fruit. Now, Eve suddenly worships the tree of the knowledge as a god, even as all nature weeps for her fall. Her thoughts turn to Adam. Her thoughts turn to Adam. and she decides that he must eat the fruit also now we are moving to question number 10 of paper 2 2014 case set examination question number 
a metaphysical conceit what is metaphysical conceit metaphysical conceit is an extended comparison so let's try to understand first metaphysical conceit what is metaphysical conceit metaphysical conceit is a very complex and often lofty literary device that makes a far stretched comparison between a spiritual aspect of a person and a physical thing of physical thing in the world so in a very simple way it's an extended metaphor we can say metaphysical conceit is an extended metaphor which can sometimes last through the entire poem this is one answer now what is oxymoron oxymoron is a figure of speech which combines the contradictory words with the opposing meanings for example old news define uh, defining uh, and def so we can say organized chaos so the contradictory words we find then personification very simple when we attribute the human characteristics to something which is not human then uh, metonymy metonymy is a figure of speech in which the name the name of an object or concept is replaced with a word which is closely related to or suggested by the original for example crown so crown here refers to king so that is the metonymy so metaphysical conceit means an extended comparison now charles lamb charles lamb defended restoration drama against the charges of immortality against the charges of immortality question number 11 which of the following description is not used is not used for the 18th century and the answer is here which is not used here the sentimental age the sentimental is age is not used in the 18th century that means to say the augustan age age of good sense neo classical period is described in the 18th century so what is augustan age here the period of english literature in the 18th century when writers like swift and alexander pope they were very much active and the name has come from the roman emperor augustus who ruled when virgil horace and ovid they were writing and it suggests a classical period of literature so let's move to the next question number 12 uh, one more thing is about uh, classical age here this 18th century the 18th century in england is also called as the classical age or the augustan age in literature it is also called as the age of good sense or the age of reason so 18th century is called as the augustan age age of good sense neo classical period age of good is uh, age, age of reason okay so it is not called as the sentimental age now the question number 12 the rape uh, sorry in in the rape of the lock belinda belinda's lock is finally transformed into a star so answer is here is finally transformed into a star so the rape of the lock is a it's a narrative mock poem by alexander pope which was first published in 1712 1712 and later it was published in a longer version in 1714 1714 and this is one of the best example of mock epic poem so rap of the lock lock by alexander pope and where the lock belinda's lock finally changes into the into a star so which question number 13 which of the following writers is not a satirist so william cooper is not a satirist so who are the others dryden samuel sorry it's it's a samuel butler then swift jonathan swift so dryden john dryden samuel butler jonathan swift they are the satirist william cooper is not satirist so question number 14 vindication of the rights of women was written by whom it's written by mary wollstan wollstani craft mary wollstani craft vindication of the right of women is it is written by mary wollstonecraft and uh, it's it's uh, it's written on political and moral subjects and mary wollstonecraft she is a british philosopher and uh, as well as a women's 
राइट्स वीमेंस राइट्स एक्टिविस्ट क्वेश्चन नंबर फिफ्टीन सर फ्रेटफुल प्लेजरी अपीयर्स इन शेरिडेंस द क्रिटिक इट अपीयर्स इन शेरिडेंस द क्रिटिक सो सर फ्रेटफुल प्लेजरी इज अ फिक्शनल कैरेक्टर फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल सर फ्रेटफुल प्लेजरी इट्स अ फिक्शनल कैरेक्टर इन वेयर इट्स अ फिक्शनल कैरेक्टर ऑफ रिचर्ड प्रिंसले इज फेमस प्ले रिचर्ड प्रिंसले शेरिडेंस फेमस प्ले द क्रिटिक so sir fretful pleasury is a fictional character in richard prinsley sheridan's play sheridan's play the critic which was first performed in 1779 and the character is based on the english dramatist richard uh, cumberland who had expressed his contempt for sheridan's the school or the scandal Which was published in seventeen seventy seven one triple seven. Now the next question: the subtitle of Frankenstein refers to the myth of Prometheus. Mister, myth of Prometheus, from Athens, from Athens. So, uh, the question was sixteen. Mary Shelley, Mary Shelley's eighteen eighteen. One eight one eight's masterpiece Frankenstein is famously subtitled "The Modern Prometheus" after the Greek myth myth of Prometheus. So the subtitle of Frankenstein is here, "The Modern Prometheus." Question number seventeen. Coleridge describes the creative imagination as a secondary imagination. Now the question number eighteen. The following is not referred by Wordsworth in his preface to the Lyrical Ballads. So, we, which is not referred in his preface to Lyrical Ballad, that is the political ideology. That means to say, popular fiction, expression of emotions, the diction of the the diction of the neoclassical poets are referred in Wordsworth's preface to the Lyrical Ballads. Now, the extra information is here in the preface to lyrical ballads by Words by Wordsworth. Here, Wordsworth outlines his definition of the nature and the functions of poetry, as well as he identifies the qualities. He identifies the one minute. he identifies the qualities that makes someone as a true poet and wordsworth breaks down the poet's process into four stages so he says that first stage is here observation tranquility and filtering and imagination so he brings here four stages that is observation tranquility filtering and imagination next question is here it is a truth well known these famous opening lines of pride and prejudice are ironical lines they are the ironical and the pride and prejudice is an 1813 novel of manners by jen by jen austin then who among the following is not a member of the fictional spectator club invented by richard steel there is a lawyer anton lawyer lawyer anton is not the is not a club member who are the club member roger t captain sentry and the will honeycomb So the spectators' club is the group of men with whom Steele used to sit and used to chat, used to chat a lot. And the group of fine gentlemen includes here Sir Roger D, uh, a nameless lawyer, Sir Andrew Freeport, Captain Sentry, Will Honeycomb, and a nameless uh, and a nameless uh, clergyman. Question number twenty-one, Madame de Farge, in in the A tale of two cities is associated with whom? Madame de Farge is associated with the Jacobins. So, Madame Theresa de Farge is a fictional character and the main antagonist of the fifteen eighteen fifteen nine novel, A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. So, A Tale of Two Cities is written by Charles Dickens, and Madame de Farge is a fictional character and that is associated with the Jacobins. Question number twenty-two: Matthew Arnold refers to the English middle class as Philistines. Matthew Arnold refers to the English middle class as the 
Philistines. So in his work, Culture and Anarchy, Matthew Arnold divides society into the three classes. One is barbarians, second is Philistines, and the third one is here, populace. Barbarians refers to the landed aristocracy. Philistines refers to the middle class, bankers, artisans, and the shop owners. And populace refers to the commoners, wage laborers, tenants, and so on. Question number 23. Neely Dean in Wuthering Heights is, a, is an unreliable narrator. So, Wuthering Heights is an 1847 novel written by Emily Bronte, initially published under her pen name called Alice Bell. So, Alice, Ellen Ellie, Ellen Ellie Dean is a female character in Emily Bronte's 1847 novel that is called Wuthering Heights. She's the main narrator in the book and she provides eyewitness accounts of many of the story's central events to Mr. Lockwood. So, Nellie Dean is the female character in Wuthering Heights of Emily Bronte. Emily Bronte. The phrase dark satanic mills appears in. So, there is no correct answer in this question. So, in this question, a uh, grace mark was given. So, what is the correct answer? Dark satanic mills appeared in an epic poem of William Black. That is the name is here. Milton, a poem between 1804 to 1808. So dark satanic verses, dark satanic mills appears in the appears in the epic poem of William Black. And the poem's name is here, Milton, a poem, which was published in between 1804 to 1808. Now, match the novel with its author. So I'm going to match it here. With the help of this answer, the answer is here one to six. Uh, uh, Barchester Towers, Barchester Towers, written by Anthony Trollope. North and South, written by Elizabeth Gaskell. The Cloister and he and Hearth, written by Charles Reed. And uh, Treasure Island, written by R. L. Stevenson. R. L. Stevenson. Now we are moving to question number twenty six. In Eliot's poem, Prufrock admits that he is not Hamlet. So the love songs of J. Alfred Prufrock, which is known as Prufrock, is the first professionally published poem by American-born British poet T.S. Eliot, where he has admits that he is not Hamlet. Question number 27. In Women in Love, in Women in Love, who is Birkin? Who is Birkin? So Birkin is Birkin is Lawrence mouthpiece. So here Rupert Birkin. Rupert Birkin is a fictional character in D. H. Lawrence's famous novel called Women in Love, which was published in 1920. 1920. And Rupert Birkin, who is he? He's an introspective school inspector, a very sickly introspective school inspector. In Women's Love, Women's Love is written by D. H. Lawrence, published in 1920. The highlighted one are the answers. A poem should not mean but be. Is uh, it's, a, it's a line written by. So there's no answer. There's no correct answer out of the four options. So again, the grace mark was given. What is the correct answer is here? MacLeish. It's written by MacLeish. M-C-L-E-I-S-H. MacLeish has ended his poem title a poem a poem should not mean but he so Maclean ended his poem Ars Poetica Ars Poetica A-R-S-P-O-E-T-I-C-A MacLeish -E has written a poem Ars Poetica and in this poem the poet has ended the poem with this line a poem should not mean but be next the action in the heart of the matter takes place in a British colony. So answer is a British colony. So the heart of the matter, it's a novel written by Graham Greene in 1948. Heart of the matter, it's written by Graham Greene in 1948. And uh, here in this novel, the action takes place in a British colony. 
Now question number 30. Which of the following works by George Orwell is a is a diastopia, diastopia or dystopia, diastopia, obviously 1984. 1984, so the diastopian novels portray the fictional societies that are marked by traits such as operation or the mass poverty, which brings the feelings of fear for the reader. So George Orwell's 1984 is a perfect example of diastopian novel because these traits, the, sorry, these kind of uh, uh, elements like operation mass poverty can be seen. 31, question number 31, the style of Beckett, the style of Beckett in his fiction is best described in, best described as minimalist. So Samuel Barclay Beckett, Samuel Barclay Beckett, uh, who is he? He is an uh, Irish novelist, dramatist, short story writer, theater director, poet, literary translator. And uh, most of his work are quite bleak, impersonal, tragic comic could be seen. His plays are very much rich with clownish, clownish characters, slapstick, humor, etc. Question number 32. Post-war immigrant writing in England. Answer is here. They seize, they seize racialist, racialist attitudes as still prevalent. So among the best post-war British authors, we find here the Welsh poet Dylan Thomas, Dylan Thomas and the Irish expatriate novelist and the playwright Samuel Beckett. So in the post-war immigrant writer in England are um, Dylan Thomas and Samuel Beckett. Uh, better, of, better, of course, if, imagines, if images are, were plain, Warnings clearly said, shapes put down quite still. These lines have been described as providing the manifesto to the moment poetry. Who wrote these lines? These lines are written by Kingsley, Kingsley Amis. Kingsley Amis have written and this is called as a moment poetry. Now, what is moment poetry? Moment poetry was quite very clear, simple, more structured and more modest in its style and subject matter. So who are the moment moment poets? Remember the moment poets question may appear. Uh, Philip Larkin, Kingsley Amis, Elizabeth Jennings, Thomas Gunn, John Wayne, DJ Enright, Robert Conquest. They are the moment poets. Now we are moving to question number 34. What is common to Jadik Smith? Jadik Smith how you pronounce it, or the Khalil, Phillips, Monica, Lee, and Hanif Qureshi, they write about immigrants in UK. So these three, author, these three authors, Smith, Khalil, Phillips, Monica, and Hanif Qureshi, they write about immigrants in the UK. So now we are moving to question number 35. The writer best known for his campus novel. So which writer is best known for campus novel? Campus novel, David Lodge. So what is campus novel exactly? The campus novels, the campus novels, novel is a book which mainly takes place on a university campus. And these novels can be comic in nature or more serious. So there are many examples of both kinds of campus novels. Usually, a faculty member serves the narrator to the main character. So, David Lodge, who is best known as a campus novelist, so his famous work is here, Changing Places, has been considered as the first campus novel as a uh, British novelist. Which, which novel? Changing Places. Then, Changing Places is also subtitled as A Tale of Two Campuses. It recalls Charles Dickens' novel, The Tale of uh, two cities and the novel Changing Places was published in 1975. Question number 36. Next to, of course, God America is a poem by E.E. E. Cummings, which critics sentimental nationalism, uh, jingoism, beliefs in America's greatness. So next to, of course, God America is an anti-war poem. 
This poem is an anti-war poem written in aftermath of World War One. Sometimes it's also considered as an anti-American poem also. Question number 37. All right then, I'll go to hell. So this statement is made by Huck Finn. It's made by Huck Finn. And uh, this and this is with reference to Mark Wen's famous novel, The Adventure of Huckleberry Finn. This statement has been taken from Mark Wen's Mark Twen, Mark Wen's famous novel, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. <clears throat> Question number 38. Chinua Achieve's novel No Longer at Ease takes its title from a poem by T.S. Eliot. So let me tell you some brief uh, about No Longer at Ease. So No Longer at Ease, what is No Longer at Ease? Uh, no Longer at Ease is a sequel to Achieve's work, Things Fall Apart. Okay. And Things Fall Apart, the title of Things Fall Apart has come from W. E. Eats famous poem, The Second Coming. So obviously, No Longer at Ease is the second is the sequel of the uh, sequel of Things Fall Apart. So, it, and its title also comes from the uh, famous poem by T. S. Eliot. That is the Second Coming. Question number thirty-nine. Tagore deals with terrorism in his famous novel four chapters so four chapters which was published by tagore in 1934 which is against the backdrop of the pre-independence revolutionary terrorist movement in bengal question number 14 in the story draupadi the tribal woman stands naked confronting senanayak this gesture can be interpreted as an attempt all three answers are correct one two three to shame her victimizers, to challenge their masculinity, to show herself as they wanted to see her. <clears throat> so who has written this work, Draupadi? Draupadi is a short story of around 20 pages written by, uh, written in Bengali language by Mahashweta Devi, Mahashweta Devi. Now, question number 41. The intentional fallacy is a concept supported by the new criticism, the intentional fallacy is supported by new criticism. Some extra information. The idea of the intentional fallacy was first elaborated in an article titled, in an article titled by M.C. Bursley and W.K. Wimsart. So Wimsart has given this main idea. Wimsart, W.K. Wimsart has given the main idea of intentional fallacy in 1947. So, Wimsart is often considered with the concept of inten intentional fallacy, which he developed with uh, Monroe Bursley in order to discuss the importance of an author's intentions for the creation of a work of art. So, Wimsart relate related to intentional fallacy. Intentional fallacy. Then, question number 42. The residual and emergent. So, there are two terms are here dominant dominant residual emergent so these three terms are given by raymond williams dominant residual and emergent these three terms are given by raymond williams question number 43 can the subaltern speak by gayatri speak wack discusses sati from the perspective of all the answers, representation, liberal politics, the ethics of intervention, all. So, Gayatri Chakravarti Spivak, Spivak, in her influential essay, she has written an essay, Can the Subaltern Speak? She argues that the abolition of the Hindu right of Sati in India by the British has been generally understood as a case of white men saving brown, brown women from brown men. She says that the abolition of the Hindu right of Sati in India by the British has been generally understood as a case of white men saving brown women from brown men. So this is a further explanation. 
क्वेश्चन नंबर फोर्टी फोर द कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ कैलेबन कॉम्प्लेक्स वॉज पॉपुलराइज बाई मनोनी सो जनरली द डिपेंडेंस कॉम्प्लेक्स कैलेबन मीन्स यूर डिपेंडेंस डिपेंडेंस कॉम्प्लेक्स मनोनी बिलीव दैट द लैक ऑफ स्टेबिलिटी कॉज स्ट्रॉन्ग रिलायंस ऑन द कॉलोनाइजर्स 45 question 45 the statement the age of mega narrative is over the statement the age of mega narrative is over is attributed to whom to jf yothard to jf yothard the age of mega narratives is over and the statement is narrated uh, attributed to jf yothard a terrible beauty is born it's an example of oxymoron so what is oxymoron so here we will try to understand the remaining figures of speech also oxymoron is a figure of speech which combine which combines the contradictory words with some opposing meaning for example old news original organized chaos second is here uh, second is here cynic docky cynic docky cynic docky cynic docky is a this is cynic it's not cynic talk it's a cynic docky cynic docky docky it's a figure of speech in which you use a part of something to stand for the whole thing one part which relates to the whole thing if your parents buy you a car and you say that you just go you just got a new set of wheels that means you are using uh, you are telling i have got a new set of wheels is of car so that's called here cynic dock cynic docky cynic docky so you are using the wheels which are a part of the car so it here refers to the whole car next hyperbole hyperbole is an intentional exaggeration or the very exaggerated statement bada chada ke that is not meant to be taken literally for example the sentence i slept for a week after the tough practice it's an example of hyperbole the speaker didn't really sleep for a week but they are using hyperbole to express that they slept for a long time so you got some extra answer so a terrible beauty is born and the answer is here oxymoron beauty that is terrible then in a metaphor the metaphorical the metaphoric word is called as a vehicle in a metaphor the metaphoric word is called as a vehicle so let's understand the next uh, few more expressions here drop what is drop drop is a word used in a known literal sense to create a powerful image for example if you say chicago's worker bees buzz around the streets so you are using a drop workers are not really bees okay workers are not really bees it suggests how fast they move so drop refers to different types of figures of speech such as puns metaphors similes next tenor 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 is what is getting reimagined by the other part of the metaphor that is the vehicle then we have another word here register register is defined as a level of formality in language that's determined by the context in which it is spoken or written so it can be formal or as well as informal so formal speech is proper in in the informal speech is conversational or casual so in metaphor the metaphoric word is called as the vehicle question number 48 which literary element is abused by bertolt brecht in his play three penny opera dens ex machina dens ex machina is abused so question number 49 a single monosyllabic rhyme is called as masculine rhyme single monosyllabic so that means to say single rhyme single monosyllabic rhyme here a rhyme between final stress syllable then another expression we have feminine rhyme feminine rhyme is to say double rhyme so in a poetry a rhyme involving two syllables next we have i rhyme i rhyme means very imperfect rhyme in which two words are spelled similarly but they are pronounced differently for example move and love so last three letters o v e and o v move and love bow and thought 
come and home so so the last the, the last spelling is quite similar but the pronunciation is different laughter and daughter end rhyme refers to the which uh, which occurs in the final words of the lines of poetry so single monosyllabic rhyme is here masculine rhyme last question for this question paper the terms strophe antistrophe and epode epodo are associated with ode so there are three terms generally they are associated with the classic ode we can say the correct answer is here classic ode so what is ode is here ode is a lyrical verse a classic ode is structured in the three major parts one is strophe one is antistrophe and the third one is here epode okay and the strophe it usually consists of two or more lines repeated as a unit and antistrophe followed the strophe and preceded by the epode so friends like this i have tried to solve the question paper of 2014 case it examination case it question paper case it english question paper paper 2 i have solved only paper 2 and these answers are based on the answer key provided by the exam conducting university at the university that is university of masur and for further reference kindly go through the uh, the particular prescribed reference books i just try my best to give some extra explanation your comment and your explanation are most welcome thank you so much